Right, we are in Hebrews chapter 11 uh, for today's class. Thank you for watching this. Uh, the summary of the book, a list of men and women from the Old Testament are presented as ones who lived by faith. Some people have called Hebrews chapter 11 the hall of faith uh, chapter. And so here's some observations I want to take from this. Uh, it's about 40 or so verses, uh, just a great chapter recounting a lot of people from history that we can learn from. Number one, faith is defined as the assurance of the things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. That's the language from the English Standard Version. Let's read that verse, Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. The King James Version, instead of the word conviction, will say evidence, the evidence of the things not seen. Our faith is not a blind faith. It is a, a sense. It is seeing the unseen. This is the definition of faith. People talk about faith all the time. I'm someone of faith. There's perhaps they say there's different kinds of faiths. This is the faith that I follow. This is faith defined. The definition of faith. Hebrews chapter 11, verse number one. Faith does not contradict reason. It's not a leap in the dark. You're seeing that faith is something that is logical, something that makes sense. It's conviction of things that are spiritual and things we do not see. John 4, 24, God is spirit, and we, we have faith in a spiritual being. This whole chapter is about having faith in something in the future, some future promise, some future blessing. There's a couple other good scriptures about faith. Uh, 1 John 5, 4, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. How do you get faith? Well, Romans 10, 17 says, uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. So faith is defined in the book of Hebrews. And we see through scripture how to access and how to develop and how to grow faith. And then we're going to see in verse number six how essential faith is. So let's look uh, at uh, now point number two. The world was created by the word of God ex nihilo. So let's work our way there first and from verse number two. For by uh, it, by faith, for by it the people of old receive their commendation. Uh, we're going to learn from the people we're going to look through in this text, Romans chapter 15, verse four, the things that were written before time were written for our learning. And so we can learn from each person in each event that we recount from the scriptures. Verse three though, by faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what was seen was not made out of things that are visible. This is an important verse. I've talked to some honest uh, sincere Christians who actually have a conflicting view of creation. They believe in the New Testament and the Old Testament. They believe in the scriptures. They believe in the church. They believe in the plan of salvation. But they have a hard time accepting the creation account, or at least the literal creation account. And statistics have become quite alarming these days as people are doubting the origin of the universe, the origin and in, in taking the Genesis creation account literally. However, when I look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 3, at the very beginning of this chapter of faith, we're seeing how essential it is to our faith that we accept and believe the fundamental scenes of Genesis chapter 1. If you doubt and struggle with Genesis chapter 1, you're going to struggle with everything from there to Revelation 22. And so we do believe, we ought to believe, that the universe was created ex nihilo. That is a Latin word meaning out of nothing. It was created by uh, the word uh, of God. It spoke the world into existence. It is the origin. Even people who uh, will tell me they don't believe in the Genesis account, and I'll ask them, well, how old is the universe? How old is the earth? And they'll say, well, it's like 7 billion years old. I'm saying, okay, let's just assume it really is that old. And I don't believe the Biblical genealogies support that, but let's assume you're right. You still believe in an origin. You still believe in a beginning. When did that start? 
and how did it start? You have to accept some origin at some point. It even makes logical sense with even science, the law of uh, thermodynamics, uh, having a, a beginning, a cause. And for every cause, there has to be an adequate greater effect uh, for that cause to have happen. There's some good passages that we could uh, explore if we want to go into more detail in looking at this question. Uh, it took me to Psalm 33, uh, verse number six. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all uh, their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him, for he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood Firm. And he goes on and talks more in Psalm 33 about the creation events that took place. But this is part of our uh, faith. It's one of the tenets of our faith, believing that the universe was created by the word of God. Point number three we're going to look at is biblical faith involves action and obedience. This is going to be the theme for the next, the rest of the chapter, that these are people of faith who had cognitive, intellectual belief in God and his plan. And his promises, but not only that, it didn't stop there with just a simple belief. It was, I'm going to act. And the reoccurring theme we're going to see is during their time and their life and their events surrounding their life, those people made present day decisions based on something that's in the future. And so the application we're going to continue to make, either if you're a first century Christian Hebrew listener from the book of Hebrews, or if you're whatever century and you're, that you're reading these words, you will need to make present day choices based on the faith of something in the future, a greater future, a greater reward, a greater blessing and promise. Present day choices based on something that you haven't seen, something that is coming, something that's in the future. So faith has always demanded action and obedience, trust and obey, for there's no other way we sometimes sing. Uh, and, and that's that hymn. J James 2 um, talks all about what this faith looks like. And so we'll begin in verse number four, and we'll kind of break down some examples. Um, by fa uh, faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice. This is Genesis 4, verses 4 through 8, uh, than Cain, through which he ha was commanded as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. And through his faith, Though he died, he still speaks. So we're introduced at the very beginning of scripture, Genesis 4, Abel's sacrifice uh, was greater because it was an, a sacrifice of faith. Uh, it was greater than that of Cain's. We don't know all the details of what made it better, but nevertheless, it was, uh, it was the best perhaps, or it was one that was actually given through faith. Abel's sacrifice was better. And it, he speaks, Abel's long been dead, but he speaks today. That is a legacy that was set in stone thousands and thousands of years ago that we're reading about the sacrifice of Abel and how he's still speaking in the present tense. When you think about legacy and you think about Christianity, what are you doing today that is going to continue to speak volumes, not only by actual words, but by your actions and what you've said and how you behaved in the past and what you stood for? The lessons that continue to be spoken years and years later, there's a lesson, a legacy that you can discover from Abel. Verse number five, by faith, Enoch was taken up. This is Genesis 5, verses 22 through 34, uh, 24. Very little information about him, but we see by faith, Enoch was taken up so that he should not taste death. And he was not found because God had taken him now, before he was taken, he was commended as having pleased God. He's one of uh, just a handful that were ever taken by God. Elijah in 2 Kings, um, 2 Kings is a, um, I forget the exact reference, in chapter 2, verse 11, was taken up as well. Uh, let's, let's look at verse 6, and this is our fourth point. It is impossible to please God without faith. Not the first time we've seen the word impossible in the book. We, we saw in the last chapter, Hebrews 10, verse 4, it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to, uh, for, for you to have the sac, uh, forgiveness, uh, for that to take away your sins. Uh, we saw the word impossible in Hebrews uh, chapter 6, talking about uh, those who 
uh, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 4, impossible. In the case of those who once been enlightened, taste the heavenly gift, shared in the Holy Spirit, tasted the goodness of the word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away. So it's impossible to be saved. You can go back to the old law and try to find salvation. You can't. Here it's saying it is impossible. Uh, without faith, it's impossible to please him. Faith is critical. Faith is essential. Mark chapter 16, verse 16. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Comma, both of those are important. There's a conjunction. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. But then it goes on to say the latter part of that verse. He who does not believe will be condemned. Some have told me, well, it doesn't say not baptized. Well, why would you get baptized if you don't believe? Uh, baptism means nothing without belief. Belief is essential first. You got to believe, and then that way, based on your faith, and when you're obeying, there you can find salvation. He who believes and is baptized. So Hebrews 11, uh, verse 6, shows the essentiality of belief. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. If you really have a sincere biblical faith, you shouldn't be lost. You should have eternal life because you're going to believe and you're going to follow what the scriptures teach. Uh, there's actually one other verse I want to look at, uh, a way that belief is described. It actually comes from First Chronicles in chapter uh, 28 when David is uh, writing to his son Solomon. He says in verse number uh, 9, he says, And you, Solomon, my son, know the God of your father and serve him with your whole heart and with a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands all uh, every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Let's go ahead and uh, look at a few more verses here. Uh, verse number seven. By faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen, i.e. global destruction, global flood, it was something never seen. It was something that was being told, and he's going to make decisions based on something he hasn't seen. He, he doesn't know really what this means, but he's going to follow God's word. Look at his reaction. In reverent fear, that's the response. In reverent fear, constructed an ark for the saving of his household. And by this, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. So he condemned the world. He was preaching, it seems like, trying to get people to you know, reject what they're doing, to be saved, come into the ark. But also by just building the ark itself, by that action, sometimes our silent behavior, our actions speak loudly. They, they silently condemn because you're doing the right thing. And it shows people, it's very obvious, it's very distinct that what you're doing is wrong. And I'm doing something that seems crazy, but it's because of something that's coming in the future. So it can silently condemn. In verse number eight, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. Again, a future inheritance. He doesn't know really much about this. Can he really trust what he's going to do? He's never, um, he didn't know where he was going, but he went. He went because God told him it was some future promised blessing that he made the present day decision to be obedient. The reoccurring theme of everything that we're reading. Uh, ver verse 9, by faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land. He was a sojourner in his own land. We read in some of the other scriptures, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him to the same promise. It was the same blessing, and the same promise from God to Abraham was given to Isaac as well as to Jacob about something in the future. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder in God. So point number four, uh, five, we have a heavenly city awaiting us in the future. You see this a couple times in this chapter. You saw it here in Hebrews 11, verse 10. Also in verse 14, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. Verse number 16, but as it is, they desire a better country. What kind? That is a heavenly one. It's another hymn that we sing. This world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. The angels beckon me from heaven's open left door. And I can't live at home in this world anymore. 
be at home in this world anymore. Uh, and then it says in verse number 16, therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city. What is he prepared? Uh, John 14 verses one and two. Uh, and also verse three, Jesus said he goes to prepare a place for us. If he goes to prepare a place for us, he's going to come back and take us to that place. There's a, a verse in Philippians 3, verse 20, that's always really spoke loudly to me, where it says, um, Philippians 3, 20, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's look at some more points here. Uh, verse number 11, by faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive, even though she was past the age, since she considered him faithful, who had promised. Now, of course, this would be in reference to Isaac. Isaac would be born miraculously in the sense that she was past the age of childbearing and she trusted. Well, at first she laughed. That's literally what Isaac's name means, laughter, because she's like, yeah, that's going to happen. Then she realized, well, Yahweh's saying this, I, I got to believe it. So she believed it, and it happened. It happened later on. Uh, verse number 12, therefore from one man and him as good as dead uh, were born descendants, and many of the stars of heaven, as many as innumerable sands of uh, the seashore. Uh, a, a great verse there uh, in reference to the descendants of Abraham, which would be, uh, would be many as we see in um, uh, all three of the global world religions uh, go back uh, to the time of Abraham, go back to Abraham. Uh, let's continue here. These all died in faith. Um, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. So all these people of old have died. They never got to experience what was promised. It's just like people in the, uh, who never get to experience the kingdom. They never get to experience the fullness of God's promises and the scheme of redemption, the plan of salvation. You know, there's a couple of passages that can illustrate this from Matthew. I'll begin first, Matthew 11, verse number 11, where it says, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist, a great human being. He prepared the way for the Lord. But look what it says. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. See, John never got to experience the kingdom of God. He never got to experience the kingdom that was coming. He never got to experience the church. It takes me to another passage in Matthew chapter 13, verse 17, where Jesus says, For truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it. And to hear what you hear and did not hear. They were getting to see the kingdom coming uh, and being uh, the kingdom of God is at hand. It was being taught and preached in that time. And, and even in the church, notice that in the church, you're no longer strangers and uh, aliens or exiles. Ephesians 2 verse 19. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens or sojourners, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. It's a great passage, letting the Bible uh, define itself. Okay, we'll continue. I want to work my way to verse 22 here. Uh, in point, verse 14, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they, uh, would, um, they would have had opportunity to return. I've already read verse 16, but I'll read it again. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one, Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. I think the King James may say the word tempted here. You got to look at the context to understand really what does that mean. Uh, James 1.13 uh, talks about how God doesn't tempt anyone, but he, he does test. And he allows us to be tested as shown in passages like Genesis chapter 22. Uh, you see um, he was tested. And, and he was willing and ready to offer up Isaac as a sacrifice because he believed what it says here. And he who has received the promises was in the act of offering up his only son, of whom it was said, through Isaac shall your offspring be named. And he thought, well, if I'm going to 
surely God will intervene. God could raise him back to life. God, the promise has to be fulfilled through Isaac. Isaac has to stay alive for the promise to be, uh, to be fulfilled. Isaac has to have children for, for the, the promise to be fulfilled. So Abraham believed that even though he's being told and tested to do this, God had a plan. And that's why verse number 19, he considered that God was able even to raise him from the dead, though which he figuratively speaking, he did receive him back. And by faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. It's all about the future blessings. Uh, and, you know, Isaac believed the promises. He believed that the promises would be fulfilled through Jacob and his descendants. The promise eventually leading to Jesus, the Messiah, to the kingdom, and to the church. Uh, same thing with jo Jacob. Verse number 21, by faith Jacob, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over uh, the head of his staff. This is from Genesis 28, verses uh, uh, the, the, the most of the chapter. But what's really amazing to me is a sixth point. Joseph, by faith, gave directions about bringing his bones to the promised land. Let's read that verse. By faith, J Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave direction concerning his bones, which would not see the fulfillment for another 400 years. Let's kind of break down how the history went just real brief, because I always find this this account and this deep faith um, truly re remarkable. First is in Genesis 50, verse 24. Genesis 50, verse 24, very end of the book of Genesis. And Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will visit you and bring you up out of this land to a land that he swore to Abraham and to Isaac and to Jacob. Then Jake, Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, surely God, God will surely visit you and you shall carry up my bones from here. So Joseph died being 110 years old and they embalmed him and he was put in a coffin in Egypt. Fast forward to the time of Moses and then he would take them into the, to the promised land, guide them through the wilderness. And there's a, 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 a mention about Joseph, Joseph's bones in Exodus 13, verse 19. Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for Joseph had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones with you from here. Fast forward. Moses dies. Joshua takes over. Joshua takes him into the promised land. The land promise is fulfilled in the very, very end of Joshua. Look what, what is mentioned. In Joshua chapter 24, Verse number uh, 32. As for the bones of Joseph, which the people of Israel brought up from Egypt, they buried them at Shechem. And the piece of land that Jacob bought with the sons of Hamar, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of money, it became an inheritance to the descendants of Joseph. It was fulfilled 400 years later. Joseph was long dead, but he had faith that they would make it to the promised land. They would make it to that land that was foretold to his great-great-grandfather, Abraham. Let's look at another couple of verses. Uh, verse number 23, first, by faith Moses, when he was born, was hidden for three months by his parents because they saw that the child was beautiful. They were afraid of the king's edict. By faith Moses, when he had grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to be mistreated with the people of God than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. And before I read the rest of, about Moses here, the point number seven is Moses made free will decisions to follow an invisible God. You see this as a, a record of Moses. He continued to make choices based on something in the future. It's all about free will and choice. Verse number 26, he considered the reproach of Christ greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, for he was looking to the reward. By faith, when he left Egypt, not being afraid of the anger of the king uh, or Pharaoh, for he had endured as seeing him who is invisible. He wasn't afraid of Pharaoh. He was more afraid of the living God. He went to follow him and do the right thing no matter what. Verse 28, by faith, he kept the Passover and sprinkled the blood, remember in the, the 10th plague, so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch them. He hadn't witnessed this before. He's kind of confused. Why are we doing this? Why are we putting blood around the do uh, doorposts and, and the sides? Because I trust God. 
I'm doing what he's telling me to do. I'm doing things based on the future and things I haven't seen. Constantly making the free will right choice because of something that was coming in the future. And by faith, the people crossed the land, the Red Sea, as undry land. But the Egyptians, when they attempted to do the same, were drowned. I have a little note in my Bible. Different faiths, different fates. Different faiths, F-A-I-T-H-S, different fates, F-A-T-E-S. You can see that found in verse number 29. Let's look now at um, verse 30. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after they had been circled seven days, thinking, why in the world are we doing it like this? One day, one day, one day, one time, all six days, seventh day, seven times around the walls of Jericho, and then they fall flat. That's faith. They're acting on something that God has said, hoping it will happen, and it does happen uh, in obedient faith. Verse number 31, by faith, Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had given a friendly welcome to the spies. Obviously, just uh, mentioning Rahab and her faith and her actions, we're not saying justifies everything about Rahab and her, her life. She was a harlot. That wasn't justified. She, she did lie. Um, but her overall demeanor, her overall obedience, her overall desire to see that those um, spies were, were saved. She gave them a friendly welcome. She sent them, the people out different ways who were ch- trying to come attack, uh, to kill the spies. So um, she was trying to save the spies no matter what it took. And so she made a decision, a present decision based on a better tomorrow, a better future, a better promise, better hope. Point number eight, we can learn many lessons about faith from people of old. That's what we're learning. We're learning from these people and what they did. Verse number uh, 32, but what more shall we say for time? And this shows you it was likely a sermon. What more should we say? Uh, and like each of these was like a sub point in the sermon, basically. For time would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Japheth, Japheth, of David, of Samuel. We just summarize a whole chunk of the Old Testament right there. And each of those people would have stories that could be shared about what faith looks like and by faith how they behaved and how they acted. But we learn from these people. We learn from that of old. Uh, I want to read one verse from 1 Corinthians 10. In verse number 11, 1 Corinthians 10, verse 11. Now these things happened to them as an example, but they were written down for our instruction on whom the end of ages has come. Verse number 33, uh, who through faith conquered kingdoms and forced justice, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, making you think of scenes from like uh, Judges 14, verse 6, 1 Samuel 17, verse 35. Uh, Daniel 6, verse 22, three different scenes of people who perhaps stopped the mouths of lions. They quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, were made strong at a weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to fight. Women received back their dead by resurrection, 1 Kings 17, 22. Some were tortured, or also 2 Kings 4, verse 35. Some were tortured, refusing to accept release so that they might rise again to a better life. Why would I be willing to be a martyr and die for my belief? Because I believe there's a better life. I believe there's a better promise. I believe Romans 8, 28, all things work together for the good for those who love God. Verse 36, others refused, mock, uh, others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains like Joseph and imprisonment. This is, this is the point we're getting for point nine here. God's people have always face persecution why are you willing to face present day persecution during your time because i believe something better i believe it's worth it no matter what the uh, price no matter what the cost verse number uh, 37 they were stoned they were sawn in two history says that isaiah was likely the one sawn in two they were killed with the sword they went about in skins of sheep and goats destitute afflicted and mistreated of whom the world was not worthy, uh, wandering about in deserts like Elijah in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Again, why doing all of this? For all of this, point number 10, 
faithful people of antiquity never got to experience the promise of the Messiah in his kingdom. They did it because of the promise that was coming. Verse 39, all these things, though commended through their faith, did not receive the promise. Since God has provided something better for us, they impart from us, apart from us, they should not be made perfect. They did it because of a better tomorrow. And, that, and that's the warning of Hebrews. You're facing persecution. I get it. He talked about that in Hebrews chapter 9. You are suffering. You're going through challenges and persecution. But Jesus did. Everybody in the Old Testament had to go through uh, trials, but they always did it because of the, what, the results. You reap what you sow. It was worth it. It was worth the investment. It was worth the sacrifice always, and it will be. And we'll find that out. We'll find that out one day. And I'm going to continue to strive for faithfulness, to learn from the people of old because of the promise of tomorrow. Something better is waiting me. I'm going to make the right choice today. Here's a good quote. It's always right to do the right thing. It's always right to do the right thing, no matter what the price. It's worth it. And I'm thankful that we have examples of people who showed us what it was like to live by faith. Here's some reflection questions from this chapter that you all are encouraged to Spend some time thinking about, reflecting, discussing, talking about. Number one, outside of intelligent design, what are some other theories about creation? And I have some good studies and thoughts on, some people have taken a, the creation account, not literal, but they'll look at like the different days of creation and say that each day maybe represented a period of time, a long period of time. I have some um, lessons and notes I'd be happy to share with anyone showing that it's impossible based on the text that hold that position. It's unbiblical and um, it contradicts so much of what you see in Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, that give each day a tribute, a, a long period of time rather than a literal 24 hour yom, that's the Hebrew word for day, uh, morning and evening, first day, morning and evening, second day, morning and evening, third day. And so there's some response to that. But, anyways, there's lots of different theories about um, intelligent design. Everyone has a belief about it. Every human being on earth has an opinion and something they could say about the origin of life. That's why Romans 1.20 says we are without excuse to not accept the creator because we should be able to see the evidence of creation, of a creator through creation itself. All right, point number, uh, question two is, how do the decisions you make now impact your future, good and bad? What kind of legacy are you leaving, good or bad? Uh, and that goes to question number three. What spiritual legacy are you creating? Number four, what do you refuse to do to help us uh, to help us remain faithful? What are you refusing to do right now? Like Moses, he refused certain pleasures because of the reward that would come. Are there any things that you have cut off in your life because you care about your soul and your eternal destination? Are there any things that you ought to cut off to eliminate from your life to help you remain faithful? And question five is, who is someone from the Old Testament that inspires you and why? I just got through doing an in-depth study on Nehemiah, and I continue just to be really inspired, encouraged by his leadership and by his goals that he set and, and fulfilled in his deep faith in God and, and praying to God beginning, middle, end during the rewards, during the, the, the triumphs, and during the trials and temptations. Uh, but I, I learn a lot from him. Again, appreciate you watching this class on Hebrews chapter 11. If you ever have any questions or thoughts, uh, feel free to contact me.